Thank you for joining CareerCert for our webinar, Building Resiliency in First Responders, a Complete Approach. I'm your host, Danielle. Here at CareerCert, we are passionate about helping first responders improve outcomes through flexible online education. We know that for you to best protect and care for those in our communities, you need to be at your best as well, which is why building resiliency is crucial for first responders. It's my pleasure to introduce you to our presenter, Rick Campos. Rick is a veteran firefighter, paramedic, and educator who has served in the U.S. Air Force and as an officer for a federal fire department. He has experienced firsthand the impact of burnout and mental illness on his brothers and sisters in the service. Rick is passionate about helping individuals and departments build resiliency, create effective communication, and create safe environments so we can all build better lives together. Rick, I'll let you take it from here. Thank you so much, Danielle, for that wonderful introduction. And a big thank you to CareerSurf for compiling this information and creating a webinar on this very important topic that we as first responders are dealing with day in and day out. So as we go forward, what do we know? What do we know about this mental health issue that's going on? Well, we do know this, that first responder experience rates of depression, post-traumatic stress disorder, commonly known as PTSD and other mental health issues that may lead to suicidal ideations, suicide attempts, and death by suicide and far greater percentages of the general population. And why? It's because we deal with more than the general population. So what are we gonna to cover today? Well, we're going for a complete approach today. Today, we're gonna to cover the contribution of common exposures in the public safety community, mental health conditions, asking for help, how resiliency supports the long-term care for traumatic events, creating cultures that support a provider's likelihood to seek assistance, and a very, very important message we're bringing is the resources available. Resources not just for you, but coworkers, family members, anyone that you feel may need this type of help. So, so common exposures. So things that we deal with as first responders that may contribute to PTSD. Well, there's a whole list here, but I'm going to just mention a couple that really stand out to me. Sleep restriction. The studies on this are becoming more and more widely viewed. It does not matter if your department runs one call a year or millions of calls a year. When you stay over at a firehouse or at an ambulance company, you know that you are, you are ready to rock and roll or respond to that call at any given moment. So our bodies are really never given this time to relax. Physical demanding settings. Now this goes not just for fire service, but also EMS. Out there, how many of my EMT or medics have ever hung upside down in the pouring rain trying to get an IV in a mangled car to our patient? Environmental and occupational stressors, and this can be anything from reports that need to be written, you know, more time that has to be spent at work than not at home, that also leads to the common exposures. So, we look at critical events. Now, what are critical events, right? We say it very broadly, oh, that was a critical event, or this event's pretty critical, but what is it exactly? Well, these are incidents that may have a stressful impact enough to overwhelm an individual sense of control, connections, and meaning in his or her life. Now, look at that word individuals. Critical events is a very, very relative term because what I may find critical, you may not. So understand that. Now, studies have shown that proximity, duration, and intensity of exposures are the most significant predictors of first responders' physical and mental health symptoms. So how long did it last? How close were you to it? And the intensity of the event. Now, again, very relative when it comes to intensity. So as we've studied this and we've gone into it, we've seen many different factors that can lead us to compromise our resilience. Well, right here are some of the main ones that we found are those compromising factors. Accidents involving children. Mass incidents, big MCI incidents, major fires, death of a colleague, mistakes that injure or kill a colleague or bystanders. And this may not even be a mistake that you yourself had made, but maybe a mistake someone else had made and you saw it firsthand. 
traffic accidents, burn patients, violent incidents, murder scenes, making a death notification, or even just an exposure to AIDS or any other communicable diseases that are out there. So, a few years ago, I responded to a motor vehicle accident. At this time, I was a paramedic on a truck company for a fire department. We showed up on scene, and already on scene, the mutual aid department from the neighboring community was there. As I get out of my rig and kind of check to see what is going on, I look to my right, and I saw an upside-down vehicle. As I step off, the battalion chief comes up to me, and he says to our truck company, which one of you are medics? Well, I raise my hand, and he points at me, and he says, you here now. Well, when a battalion chief speaks, you listen, right? So I walked right to the battalion chief. He takes me by the arm, and he leads me into an RV. What had happened is this car had gone into an accident. Bystanders had saw it. A good Samaritan pulled over with their RV and taken out two small children from the vehicle and put them into his RV so that the dust and the wind that was going on at the time wasn't going to interfere with any treatment. So as I get into the back of this RV, I begin to notice that there is a four-year-old child on the floor of this RV. The neighboring fire department had already started two IOs, intraosseous, basically needles in the bone for fluid in both legs. We hadn't intubated yet, but we had already trauma stripped the patient. I had been in charge of airway, so I was getting the patient airway. We had dropped an OPA at this time. Um, Life flight was on their way, so we were bagging this patient. And during this time, the patient was going in and out of seizures. What stuck out to me most, not the fact that this was a pretty traumatic event, but the fact that there were some shoes that belonged to the child sitting off to the side. Now, to anybody else, it wouldn't be a big deal, but these shoes were the exact same shoes as my four-year-old at home. Then and there, I kept it professional. I did what I had to do. But once we got back to the station, I lost it. Couldn't control it. Couldn't control my emotions. Called my wife and uh, got on FaceTime and asked to speak to my boys. And my wife had been with me through the fire service, through paramedic and all that. And she had never seen me like this. So I talked to my boys. And at that point, I knew I needed some help. So after my conversation with my family, I went to my battalion chief at the time and said, hey, this call really hit me. What do I need to do? And from there, I was able to get the treatment that I needed in order to come back to work fully able to do my job. So as you can see, it can happen to any of us. Now, as we get further on into our career, we look at things like compassion fatigue. Now, I know many of us have probably suffered this, but they never knew an idea of what to call it. You know, we get to that point to where it's frequent flyers, right? We all know what that means, frequent flyers. The guy or, or lady who keeps on calling and keeps on calling and keeps on calling, and it almost becomes like that person who cried wolf where you get the call, you know the address, you know exactly what you're going into, and you really don't even care. Well, imagine that on a broader scope, and that's what compassion fatigue is. This could occur due to exposure on one case or can be due to a cumulative level of trauma happens again and again and again and again to where you just really don't even care anymore. Uh, the overtime has been great, but you've been working so much that you just really – you're going through the motions at this point. Cumulative compassion fatigue is not trauma-related and can happen to anyone in any caregiving role. Whether you're a CNA to a doctor, you see the same patient again and again. You're working so much, it becomes repetitive. So this is definitely a warning sign for you to look out and look out for, not just in yourself, but also your, your coworkers. So PTSD or post-traumatic stress disorder, now what is this characterized by? Well, this is characterized by exposure to actual or threatened death, serious injury, or sexual violence, either directly, and here's another key point, or indirectly. So you may have dealt with it or you've just heard about it, but it still affects you. Still consider PTSD. As a veteran myself, I spent a tour in Afghanistan right after 9-11 during which time we were mortared at the base I was at. 
Now, I can sit here and tell you that I don't mind seeing fireworks. I don't mind hearing them. But I do know some brothers and sisters that serve with me that cannot be around it. They avoid that stimuli that was associated with that event. As we discussed a little bit earlier, right, individual, it's all relative. So the National Institute of Mental Health, NIMH, has identified three types of PTSD. Re-experiencing flashbacks. As being a veteran, we speak to different veteran associations and talk with people that do have flashbacks. They go moments where they're back where they were where that traumatic event situation happened. Hyperarousal. Some say it's vigilance. I can go into a large area and I start becoming hypervigilant, looking for ways out, looking for certain situations. And of course, avoidance. This is where people just don't want to be around the situation at all. And they might even utilize substance in order to create that avoidance. Because sometimes being under the influence is better than being in real life. Anxiety is another issue that we deal with. And this is characterized by a feeling of uneasiness and worry, usually generalized and unfocused as an overreaction to a situation that only subjectively seen as menacing. Yes, yes it does. And some of the symptoms that are included in an anxiety attack are muscular tension, restlessness, fatigue, problems concentrating, all lead to the anxiety issue. Now, as we delve more into common mental health issues, we're looking at field-specific trauma, right? So many traumas are specific to first responders' field of work. You know, we are in a wide variety of work that we do. You know, as a firefighter EMT, or as a company officer for a federal fire department, we respond to everything, right? Um, in my district, I do have a airport. I also have a theater. So you can see the differences that I deal with. Hazmat, EMS, rope rescue, all these different things, right? So I have a large window of opportunity, if you will, for trauma. Some of these other situations are being shot at, assaulted, threatened. You know, how many of our listeners out there have ever gone out on an ambulance or on a fire truck or a police vehicle three o'clock in the morning on a Saturday night, we're dealing with drunk individuals that are just threatening you. Circumstances involving others may include exposures to sexually assaulted children, domestic violence, watching someone die or seeing mutilated remains. These are some of the issues that we see every day and we're expected to be okay. Let that sink in. These are things we see every day and expect it to be okay. So as we get further into our lesson, into our webinar here, we're going to talk a little bit about what's available to you. Now, how do we recognize if someone is having a mental health crisis? Is someone going to walk into your station with a big sign that says, help me, I'm having a mental health crisis? No, that's not how this works. It's very important to know and recognize the warning signs that an individual may be struggling with so that you can support them in the best way possible. And right here, it is the big key word is support. Now, according to NAMI, the National Alliance on Mental Illness, the most common warning signs fall into five categories. Social withdrawal, a regular expression of feelings, mood disturbances, changes in behavior, and thought disturbances. The following are the warning signs of suicide taking steps to tie up loose ends, talking as if you're saying goodbye, making or changing will, preoccupation with death, withdrawal from friends, family, and regular activities, or, or even interests. What once was fun is no longer fun anymore, or you don't even want to do it, or your coworker doesn't want to go golfing anymore, or fishing, or whatever it is that they usually are really into, it doesn't appeal to them anymore. Failed romantic relationships, Dramatic changes in personality, mood, or behavior. Saying things like, ah, nothing matters anymore. Ah, this place will be better off without me. Ah, this life just isn't worth living anymore. Sudden cheerfulness or calm after being despondent. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're saying sudden cheerfulness? How is that a sign? Well, it's after being despondent. After being sad or 
after being very depressed for a long time, then they automatically cheer up. That's what I'm talking about. Increased drug or alcohol use. Giving away personal possessions because they feel they're not going to need them anymore. I'll give these away to someone who could use them. I'm not going to need them. Stockpiling pills or obtaining a weapon. Now, this may not be evident for those who already have access to a means of suicide. History of suicide attempts or family or friends that have had suicide attempts or have died by suicide. Now, if you recognize any of these symptoms or warning signs in yourself or those around you, it is essential to act. If for yourself, you want to reach out for a support system and ask for help. That is the biggest key. You want to ask for help. It's not a sign of weakness. Help is out there. Now, if for others, be sure to act because I would rather act and be wrong than not act and have my coworker, partner, friend, colleague, family member, whatever you want to call them, not show up the next day. Ignoring these symptoms can have very fatal consequences. So remember, if it's for yourself, ask for help. If you hear from a friend, colleague, family member, act. Now, how do we talk to someone? How do we talk to someone who's having these ideations or having these mental issues? Well, do you blow it off? Say, ah, oh, man, get over it. No, you need to take it seriously. Is a mental health crisis, express suicidal ideations or suicidal behaviors should only and always be taken seriously. Again, I would rather be wrong and report this than be right and not do anything at all. Remember to stay calm, encourage the expression of feelings, and be willing to listen without judgment or criticism. Here is the big key word. And I want you guys to, if you guys take nothing else away from this webinar, take this, listen. Now, a lot of times, right, we'll be in a conversation with a friend and they'll be giving us a problem. And as they're speaking, we're already trying to come up with a solution for them. So we're not even really listening to what they're saying because we're too busy thinking about how we're going to fix this problem for them. Stop. Listen. Actively listen to what they are saying this is a serious subject and they've trusted you don't be a hero and i know what you're saying with this topic you're thinking but that's why i'm that's why i'm in this business to be a hero it's not what i'm saying i'm saying don't be a hero on the fact that the responsibility for their complete recovery is not a burden or expectation that you need to place upon yourself back when my youngest was born about seven years ago, he's seven right now, my wife went through postpartum depression. It was a very trying time for me and my family. But as this came up, I wanted to be the hero. I felt that throwing money at the situation would make it better. Let's get out of the house, okay? Let's go do something. Let's get out of the house. Let's go. And I got tired. It was hard. It was hard to carry that burden. So as I got into the books and researching postpartum depression and looking at what I needed to do, I saw that it was essential to create a team. Right? I played sports in high school. I know team. Yeah, teamwork. Heck yeah, let's let's do this. So I got her family on board to help me, to help her. We got a therapist and we all worked together in her recovery. And thank goodness that I did. And talk to the person you're worried about. Sometimes just talking to someone makes all the difference. But before we go that route, you want to first consider whether you are the right person to approach the individual. Like, have you prepared yourself with knowledge and skills to approach the person? And I say this because how many times have we seen someone in the hallway or on the street and said, hey, how you doing? And they say, fine. But what about that one day when you say, hey, how you doing? And they just let you have it. Are you prepared? To hear that, are you prepared to deal with that? So before you go and talk to this person, prepare yourself. What if they tell me this? What if they tell me they have suicidal ideations? 
What if they tell me that things aren't all right? What am I going to do then? So this here is very true. Expect some amount of shame. Now with this true story, with the vehicle accident, I was. I was ashamed. I felt that I wasn't strong enough. I felt that, could I do this job anymore? I hid for a little while. But that's part of it. And after seeking help, I knew that I am strong enough for this job and I'm able to do it. It's just something got to me and I needed to fix it. So shame is often felt by a person experiencing declining mental health or a mental health crisis. It's important to express as clearly as you can that you care about them and support them regardless of the struggles that are present. Make it a judgment-free zone. As they're talking, listen to them. Express that there is help and hope for them. Now, as we're tackling this issue, we understand that it is becoming a bigger, bigger issue. We're reading it in the headlines. How many first responders are dying from suicide. So we know it's an issue and express to them that there is help because many organizations out there are willing to help. And we'll discuss that a little bit further down the road. Be mindful of your own feelings. All right? If things don't go well when you speak with them and they're not honest about the struggles or deny help that you're offering, we may become angry and because of your concern for their well-being. Right? How many times have we gotten mad at a friend because they didn't follow our advice? You are there to listen and help. You can't get angry, angry at them when you speak to them. Because okay, there may be denial, there may be shame, there may be a bunch of other things that you may not know what's going on, but you know something is going on. So talk with them, and if they don't want to listen to you, maybe get someone else to talk to them. But let them know that they are cared for, and they are loved, and that you do support them. So I always wondered, if therapists went to therapy, right? Because you think about it, right? When they sit on this proverbial couch... And they talk with people, and they hear all their problems, and so on and so on and so on. So you figure at some point during their day, they got to unleash this stuff. they got to let this stuff go. So I wonder if they have someone that they talk to, and they do. Now, if a therapist has a therapist, and they're professionals in this matter, don't you think we should have something like that too? Now, how do we help? Ah, right. Here's the key word, help. This is the key. You know, As first responders, that's what we do. We help. Here are some great ways to help. One, biggest key here, if you take nothing else away from this webinar, provide a listening ear. Assist the person with self-directed plan to address the crisis if appropriate. Now, if you are not able to or qualified to come up with a plan, get someone who is. Assist in researching other resources that may be helpful. Help them out. Maybe prompt them. Ask them what they feel they need and help them search for what they need. Support them through any appointments they may have. Give them that car ride. Show them that you care. Take them to lunch afterwards. Take them outside, maybe just walking in the grass. I know, right? Sounds too simple, but sometimes something as simple as that or just letting them cry in your car is enough. What if they don't want help? Not everybody wants help. True. Very true. I have a, a joke here. How many therapists does it take to change a light bulb? One. But the light bulb has to want to change. I hope you guys are giggling out there. It's true. There needs to be an intrinsic motivation for this person to change. But if they don't want to change, but you know there's an issue, stay on them. But you want to stay supportive. Ensure that the person understands that you care about them and are there whether they seek help or not. Take the long road. Someone who's not willing to seek help now does not mean that they're not going to want to seek help later. Stay with them. Keep on asking if they need help. They'll let you know if you're a burden, but even then, let them know. I'm here for you. If you need help, I'm here. doesn't matter. Day or night. You give me a call. I'll drive to wherever you are. But also take care of yourself. Seek that extra support for yourself if someone you care about declines treatment. You're going to need support as well. Because you're seeing someone that you care about slowly, slowly decline and maybe get into a very bad space. And you're going to need to talk, you're going to need to talk about it because you can't keep that bottled in either. So take care of yourself so that we don't get into that compassion fatigue. Now, how do we talk to someone who is having a mental health crisis? Well, it's important to remember that because not all symptoms of mental health crisis are obvious. 
to those around us that sometimes the person in the crisis will need to be the one to reach out. So here are a few ways to talk to someone if you are the one in the need of help. So these are just a few things that maybe you could say if you feel you need help. Now with a lot of these, these are the not so subtle ways of asking for help. I look at these and I think of someone like grabbing someone else by the collar and looking them dead in the eye and saying, hey, I'm depressed, anxious, suicidal, and I'm not sure what to ask for, but I don't want to be alone right now. That's what I see. Now, is that going to happen? Most likely not. So it's almost you have to look through a facade to see that. But if you're in control, if this is happening to you and you put yourself in control, you could say this to someone that you care about Like when you feel like you're stuck or out of options. I'm struggling with my mental health and what I've been trying isn't working. Can we meet up, talk, Skype, whatever on any date and just come up with a better plan? I need some help. Earlier in the webinar, I talked about how we recognize someone with a mental health issue and someone coming in the station with a sign that says, help me. It's not that obvious, right? But if it is you going through it, you can make it that obvious. So there's been a study. In this world, we are now more connected than anyone. We got our social media. We have internet. We have phones. We have so many ways to connect, but yet we're still not connecting. It's written somewhere that college students are saying, we're now more connected, but I never felt more alone. So if you feel that way, you feel like you need to connect with someone, ask them to check in on you, like personally. Come check on me. Make sure I'm all right. So mental health treatments. Bet you didn't know this, but PTSD is a wound that can heal. The most common mental health disorder experienced by first responders is post-traumatic stress disorder. This section will focus on the treatment that disorder. However, it is important to note that many of these treatments have been found to be effective for other mental health issues and disorders that first responders may face. Recovery from PTSD and other mental health issues triggered by traumatic events is a gradual and very much ongoing process. Neither healing nor the effects of trauma happen overnight, so we can't expect the healing to happen overnight, right? There are many steps that can be taken to cope with the residual symptoms and greatly reduce anxiety and fear that is experienced. And this could be anything. But what it really focuses on is getting your team so that you can go on and live a productive life even though you are dealing with the effects of PTSD and know that there is a light at the end of the tunnel. So how do we get this resilience? Well, a sense of community. Now, as a first responder, we are a big community from law enforcement, EMS, fire, nurses, we are all a big community, and we're there to support each other. Yeah, there's some jokes that go back and forth, but when it comes down to it, we are all one big community, and we support each other. Collective efficacy. This is a perception of the group's ability to accomplish it. It's a major task. Now, that's what we do, right? We mitigate tasks. MCI, we set up divisions, ICS, NIMS, all that great stuff. We set it up, and we attack it to get the mission completed. And that's how we attack this as well. Get your team, get your group, set it up, and let's mitigate this. Even self-efficacy, right? This is the ability to exercise some measure of control over environment. Take some control. So the long-term need for treatment for traumatic events. Now, PTSD typically does not go away on its own, especially without treatment. Symptoms can last for months to years. Now, even with successful treatment, symptoms may come and go in waves. So you may be doing really, really, really well. And something sends you back. Know that that's all right. That happens. That is okay. You can still move forward. Now, let's look at some statistics here. Raising awareness of available resources is critical to improving coverage of first responders' mental health needs. However, institutional change also needs to occur. We are in a paradigm shift now. Long gone are the days of the the hard manager behind the desk that says, ah, oh, rub some dirt on it, yeah, yeah, suck it up. Those days are gone. Things are changing. Populations are growing and areas are widening and we're still keeping the same numbers we did back in the 90s. 
So we're working, we're literally working more with less. And that needs to be acknowledged. So out of this 56 of respondents in a culture that led no encouragement or support contemplated suicide, 56, it's more than half, 12% attempted it. Now, it's not a perfect world, right? So first responders from a culture of full support and encouragement still had higher than normal activity and suicidal tendencies, but with substantially smaller percentages. Thought about suicide dropped 50%. And attempted suicide dropped by almost 75%. More and more people are walking around today because there was full support in their agency. Management should always be aware of the fact that their intervention matters. Even if the intervention is simply making your team aware of the help available and creating a culture where it is accepted and encouraged to ask for and receive help whenever and as often as needed to care for their mental health status. Like I said, it's a changing world. A higher administration out there, you ask yourself, am I ensuring that my employees know that it's okay to come to us? if they have a mental health issue? Because a lot of times, a lot of people will fail to say something simply because they think, A, how they're gonna look in front of their boss, or B, is this gonna hurt my career? So you take away those things, and you're gonna see more people ask for help, and at the end of the day, you're gonna have a happier, healthier workplace. Now in this climate where no one talks about mental health, right, first responders will feel isolated and fail to access that they need help at all. This silence can be interpreted by many as negative judgment about the health issues. Well, we kind of talked a little bit about it, right? But first of all, this is the, I'm a hero. I don't need help, I'm a hero. No, it is changing. And we are noticing it firsthand that it does affect us. So, here we got some great questions to ask ourselves, not just about ourselves, but of our agency. Whether you're the chief of the department or your first day, ask yourself some real hard questions. How does our department deal with critical events? In what ways does, do we promote open communication about mental health issues? What resources are available and promoted for our team? Now, when do supervisors talk to our team members about seeking treatment? Now, as a company officer, I know my crew, and I know when something's wrong. You know, we live together, we, we bond together, we are a family. So I know when something is wrong with my driver. And I have to ask them, hey, what's going on? And if they don't want to talk, I have to ask myself about our agency. Are we providing our members with an environment that they could talk to us? Because if we're not, then we're setting ourselves up for failure. So asking these hard questions will get us to an easier healthier work environment, right? Like, do we educate our team on the importance of mental health first aid? Do we talk about how self-care and how to maintenance that? You know, as a chief, do you educate your team on mental health treatment and common symptoms of PTSD or other mental health issues? Now, here's one that's really, really important. If someone seeks help, is it treated as a secret or something we hide underneath the rug? It's something we can all learn from and the more that we make it, maybe not public due to, the, due to the individual, but the more that we embrace it and we show the support for it, the more people could say, hey, that's happened to me and I need help. Remember, with full support, we've seen that 4% went from 12%, 12% with, full, with no support to 4% with full support. Those numbers are dropping and that means more of our first responders are getting the help that they rightly deserve. Are we creating a culture for our department that there's a barrier for our team to seek help? Like is there too much paperwork for our team members to come and seek help? Because that could always be an issue. Please, do not let your pride come before your well-being. Pride sometimes can be a very, very evil thing. And sometimes it prevents us from seeking the help that we truly need. There may be the perception that asking for help is a sign of weakness. But you got to understand something. When your body is sick, you go to the doctor, right? 
So when you have a mental health issue, it should be no different. It's just an invisible wound. You have a broken arm, you brace it. So what happens when you have an emotional issue, a mental health issue? We got to face it. So here's some resources such as the Code Green Campaign. They're at codegreencampaign.org. Now, what do they do? They educate and they do public speaking. They're an organization that is built on conferences, in-house CE events, TED Talk style events, panel discussions, custom classes related to any first responder mental health topic. They do consulting, such as formal and informal. They set up peer support or CISM, C-I-S-M teams. After a major event, they can come. They organize funeral services, and they also set up local scholarships. Yeah, First Help. Now, First Help began when its founder, Karen Solomon, writing about law enforcement in 2014. As she spoke with officers and first responders, she recognized the need for helping first responders. Now, this was in 2014. That was six years ago. So you could see that we are starting this narrative of trying to change things. Well, the solution that they came up with was a database that first responders could access. Now, First Help gives first responders quick and easy access to everything a first responder may need by answering a short questionnaire on their website. Now, note, First Help is not a provider of healthcare services, nor does First Help provide mental health advice, treatment, or care. The resources listed on the website are for information purpose only and are not referrals by First Help. They're giving you the tools to put the ball in your court to seek help. They're giving you a list of people that could possibly help you. Firsthelp.net. The All Clear Foundation.org. They focus on mental and emotional health, such as promote awareness, empowerment, acceptance, action towards mental health and emotional well being. They help mitigate physical and negative impacts, promote the optimal health and longevity. Utilize social and family by supporting long-term, healthy social and family lives. They even get to the spiritual side and share resources for those seeking spiritual, religious, or philosophical support. AllClearFoundation.org. SAMHSA. This is that Substance Abuse and Mental Health Service Administration. As we know, substance abuse runs neck and neck with PTSD. SAMHSA provides ways to find treatment training for practitioners, public messages, grants available to organizations, data surrounding programs, substance abuse and mental health issues, programs, current news, and publications. Ultimately, when people have access to resources and information, they can be more involved in designing their own treatment plan by setting goals and choosing services that support progress. With the treatment team, any person suffering from mental health issues can develop a well-rounded recovery plan. In the end, the most important thing to remember when searching for resources in the face of mental health issues is this. Though feelings of loneliness may come in the wake of dealing with mental health, you are not alone. There are so many resources out there, ladies and gentlemen, that can help us. And I implore you to take advantage of that. Again, I want to thank CareerCert for providing this webinar to you. And I also want to thank each and every one of you for signing up and taking this class. We are the first step in changing a culture. So with that, I hope you have a great day. This is Rick Campos. Thank you, Rick. We're so thrilled to have had you with us today. And thank you, everyone, for joining us as we started this important conversation on building resiliency. We do know that this is just the beginning of the conversation, and we want to continue it with you. This webinar has been the introduction to our five-part series on resiliency at CareerCert. To learn more about how you can build resiliency in your life, visit CareerCert.com. At CareerCert, we are dedicated to helping fire and EMS personnel be at their best so they can better protect their communities. Thank you for connecting us with us today. And thank you for your sacrifice to make our communities safer places.